The Build Show today, we're talking home chemistry. That's right, the things that you do in your house, whether you're building a house or whether you finished building the house, that could affect your health and your family's health. We've got some really good experts that are gonna give you some specific takeaways. Today's Build Show, all about your current house. Let's get going. Okay, guys, I got some really good experts in this field for us today. I've got Corbin and Grace Lunsford. These guys have a PBS series called HomeDiagnosis.tv. You go check that out. But guys, I wanted to talk uh, with you on this YouTube video about the things that you've learned from the home chemistry study that was done over here at the University of Texas uh, Construction Lab that I know you guys were super involved in and did a bunch of videos and uh and takeaways from. Give me a, a little bit about the study and some of the takeaways that we can take both into our construction sites and also into our current homes. Sure. So that we were brought in as storytellers because it turns out scientists are not very good at like explaining why it's important <laughs> what they do. So they were studying cooking, cleaning, and occupancy. Okay. And essentially what's important is that we spend 50 years of our lives inside of our homes. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the things that are coming into our bodies that might be not good for us are happening through our skin and through our breathing processes while we're at home. So we need to understand more about this. And so um, the three big takeaways of what you can do is don't bring bad stuff inside, ventilate and keep it dry. Okay, and makes we can, sense. We've talked about those a lot on the Build Show. Yeah, and so within cooking, cleaning, and occupancy, some of the things that they learned specifically. Well, um, specifically is the chemicals that you're using in cleaning. Like, think about it. Just take a little bit of a pause. If you turn that bottle around and you're like, "Oh, I don't, I can't pronounce half of these things. I don't know what they are," or you see things like chlorine, ammonia, those are major chemical uh, chemistry inducers, mm -hmm. and basically. You want to try and keep your chemistry low. Interesting. So yeah. like my grandparents, when they cleaned 50 years ago, they might use vinegar and water. They might just use water. There was always a wet rag right. and they might wipe down the countertops. But today we're like, oh, we got to kill the bacteria. We got to get this right. you know, heavy duty is, chemical out. And the chemicals themselves aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. But when they combine, it's the chemistry of the chemical reactions that happen. That now we've got all these products inside homes that are very different than when our parents or our grandparents were building houses. Mm -hmm. And then they're interacting with these things that we're now introducing. And it's just making all this weird you can't predict what's going to go on in any home. And yeah. really, nobody can, nobody can even really know what is happening because these scientists have just begun this process. So this is actually a larger part of the chemistry of the indoor environment. And if people want to like nerd out more, we do have a playlist called Home Chem where you can watch some of the experiments and see what was happening. We'll link to that below for Great. sure, Grace. Awesome. But if you really, really want to dig into the white papers, search Chemistry of the Indoor Environment by the Sloan Foundation. And that's where you can really get into the white papers if you want to nerd out. Interesting. Do you think that the kind of whole COVID deal that we're just on the backside mm. of maybe accelerated or exacerbated some of that. Like my wife's a internist and she's she's been telling me like we don't need to have soap in the house that we wash our hands with that has extra that's stuff in it or that says antibacterial good old animal fat that we used to use in the past and we wash our hands and we mm. vigorously scrub like the doctors do works just as well as maybe all the additional chemicals. Is yep. that is exactly. that a takeaway as it's well? It's the same as like blue, you know, HVAC with filtration, fantastic, and dehumidification. We add blue lights, we add hydroxyl sprays or, you know, any of these things that are trying to like kill or um, the oxidants. Right? I mean, we we mm -hmm. like to drink kombucha with antioxidant juices in it, right? Because mm -hmm. we're like trying to live better. But we bring in these oxidant chemicals into our home to mm -hmm. kill and clean and destroy and like, oh, let's take a moment and think, is that really, really what we want? That's actually one of the weird things about like ventilation conversation. People are like, just open your windows. And when you open your windows, yeah. you bring in ozone. If you have, if you live in a place where people mm -hmm. drive, mm -hmm. um, not out in the middle of the country. And so that is a main chemical fueler of all of this mm -hmm. reaction 
Yeah. Byproduct. So for Home Diagnosis TV, we're actually filming season three. We're on the road in Texas right now. And we are, after we're here, we're going over to UT and we are going to expose some of those large elastic um, like exercise bands, uh-huh. you know, that you can use on the yeah. road uh, to ozone to help demonstrate really what this chemical is doing to in the skin, eating. To the gaskets and yeah. homes, the wiring. I mean, you get insulation. an alert on your phone, high ozone levels. If you have asthma, be careful outside. Well, you go inside, but you open up all your windows and you mm-hmm. Bring it in, or you have asthma, you want to keep your air clean, and you saw this Instagram ad that said air purifier destroys blah, blah, blah. And what it's doing is it's introducing ozone into your home. Mm, interesting. So, what I'm hearing you say is old school filtration is really excellent. And so, you know, for instance, that good April air media cleaner that I've been putting in houses that's a MERV 15, that does a great job, but we don't need necessarily all those other things. And the kitchen example of that is, you know, the kitchen rag that uses water to wipe down your services and maybe some vinegar or some old school cleaning agent. But we don't need to get into ammonia. We don't need to get into right. uh, chlorine and some of those other things. Look at what you're using and think about it. The other takeaway that I remember from you guys uh, a couple of years ago that I learned was that things that smell in your air or that introduce, you know, spring rain smell those are adding not very good chemicals to your house. Can you speak to that, Corbin? Sure. So, so if you have something that's like an essential oil diffuser, it's emisting these little particles. And particles are 100% bad all the time. You mm-hmm. don't want to breathe particles. Especially if you've got kids. Think about the kids first. But also, VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, just things that you smell. So if you smell flowers, if you smell a bakery, if you smell pizza, that's all VOCs. VOCs aren't bad. But what they are is tinder, like fuel, for these chemical reactions. So if you have more and more smells in the house, then when a little bit of ozone comes in or a little bit of hydroxyl or chlorine or whatever it is, it fuels, it sets off this chain reaction that then totally transforms things that are happening in the air hmm. on a microsecond basis. It's you really can't see it, but it's, it's good to think about the fact that your air is literally on fire. Hmm. It's the same exact process as a campfire. It's just wow. so slow and it's low temperatures. You can't see the flames, but that is what's happening around our faces all the That's time. That's wild. Yeah. But you don't have to be like, oh my God, my house is a nightmare because I've got <laughs> candles and I've got a fireplace and all six or like my dream home build. I had a fireplace. You can still have a fireplace, but like put it out on your patio. Right. Yeah. That's right? What I did have house. the candlelit dinner on the porch. Yeah. The heroes are don't use, uh, you know, spray cleaners that have lots of chemicals in them if you can avoid them. HEPA filter on your vacuum, Mm -hmm. kitchen exhaust that goes outside Mm -hmm. and that people use all the time. And that's a whole other conversation, which I think sensors Talk to me about kitchen exhaust. I know that's a big deal. Talk to me about gas cooking versus electric versus induction. And what are those things doing to our houses? Sure, I think the simple thing is it comes down to heat and how that heat is made. Okay. So if you you use fire, you're creating Uh, Carbon monoxide is a scary one. Also nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide, all kinds of things that are definitely toxic for people. Um, Electric is better for that. But both electric and gas heat surfaces, which activates all these particles that go up into the air. Mm -hmm. Induction is the best version of it. But even it, you heat the the pan with Mm -hmm. the oil in it, and it's going to create particles too. So in all cases, you just need kitchen exhaust. If there's one hero only, one thing that somebody's going to do in their home to make it healthier kitchen exhaust would be the thing. Right. And and now they're coming out with products that actually have an infrared sensor in it that will see when you turn on a, a, a fryer or a burner and start the exhaust fan. So you like automatically? To, automatically. Oh man, that'd be awesome. And How smart is that? Here's like, you know, for the kitchen designers out there and for the homeowners, for the builders, like have some nice outlets near that cooktop because here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring your toaster over there. I want you to bring your air fryer over there so that when you're using those and you're creating particles from those heating elements that are cooking, you're still capturing them from the hood. And turn your hood on. Turn your hood and on. Use it. Yep. <laughs> and hoods that are against and walls quiet. and are closer to the right. cooktop are better because right. they're capturing more. You know, island hoods are very, very low capture. Right. Uh, and so by putting against the wall, having that solid surface. And then I did a video on makeup air, thinking about mm-hmm. makeup air and not depressurizing your house. We have makeup air too. We yeah. believe in that. Always our, good things. You know, we built our own house to show that even an idiot could do this. Like I literally built it with my mom and dad. And our kitchen exhausted is so quiet that we don't <sighs> even know it's on sometimes. I'll have to go over and like turn the, just to make sure that it's off. Cause mm-hmm. we've left it on all night and dried out the house. You know, in winter Whoops. times. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> easy to do. Yeah, it is. It is easy to do. But um, but yeah, home diagnosis. So 
the first season is in our tiny house and you can watch us go into other people's houses. And then season two, we were actually filming, we were halfway through it when COVID hit. So talk about silver linings from COVID, right? Not only did we have this new awareness about cleaning and droplets and air, but for us, we had to really take the lens away from going into other people's homes because you couldn't do that anymore and bring it all into our build and follow our personal journey, which A, made it more intimate, but I think B, really allowed us to dig into some of these topics much more deeply than we would have. It's a crash course in the fundamentals of building. And y'all have two kids, right? (laughs) We have three three now. (laughs) You have three now. Okay, so so why as a parent (laughs) is this more important for you than let's say a single 55 year old. I mean, I think that the bottom line is everybody's house should do what they want it to do. Mm -hmm. And you just have to teach people to use the language to explain what it is they want. Because somebody comes, even two Risinger uh, home clients are gonna want different things out of it, right? right? So you should just be good enough at building versatility and understanding the Lego blocks of ventilation, right. enclosure, HVAC, drying, mm-hmm. that you could put them together in different combinations to do different things for different people. For us, yeah. health of our kids is super important. So we yeah. built a house that does that. We have zero radon and, and that rounds down to zero. It's never truly zero, right? True. Um, we have dryness under control. All the things that we wanted. Energy efficiency is really, people ask us like, are, right. what are you using to track your energy? And I'm like, we don't. We don't yeah. do that because that's not a priority for us. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's also, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of a happy accident byproduct. I mean, the name it's of the game with home it. performance is control. Yeah, that's right. And so that's what we have achieved with this build. And, and living, you and I both live in very high performance houses that are very airtight. Uh, and I remember I got a comment, I got lots of troll comments, but I got lots of comments when I was talking about ventilation. And that's the third piece uh, in your trifecta there that you mentioned a minute ago, corporate. And in my house, super airtight. And then I've got a fresh air system. I've got a really nice zender, which you don't have to go to the top of the line, but I went with the real top of the line system. And someone at some point said, oh, your house is so tight, Matt that if you fart in that house, you're gonna smell it for a week. And you know what's so interesting about my house is that the exact opposite is true. My house smells so fresh and clean. And I did build a very tight enclosure. I also spent a lot of time and effort thinking about insulation and thermal bridging, all those things. Which means that even if I run my ventilation on high to the highest point, boost mode, and let's say I have a delta between the inside and the outside of 50 degrees or 60 degrees, even with that ventilation on high, I barely change the temperature in my house. And so I, I love my ventilation system and, it, and I love how fresh my house always feels. And so that fresh air is such a big deal in these tight houses. And I think those misnomers of, oh, you're gonna kill the person, you're gonna kill your <laughs> occupants, it's so tight. It's actually the opposite. It used to be true when people forgot to ventilate. But yeah, if you think about your ventilation system as like a river that's directing air, fresh air comes in, stale air goes out, and there's this pathway. Mm, if you can predict what that pathway example. is and make geometry and your plan mm-hmm. really work for you, it's the same as like when you're planning a roof, mm-hmm. right? There's a million, you can go out to any t- subdivision that's built that's like you can look at roof lines and just laugh and laugh about like how dumb it is. Mm-hmm. All the water is going to go in this particular place. It's the same exact principle. You're just mm-hmm. kind of like thinking about pressure imbalances in the home and it's kind of like Tai Chi for homes. So if you like that kind of a uh, way of thinking, then it's it suits you. But I, I also, like the river example. Yeah. And I also want to just encourage everyone to give themselves grace when it comes to building the home because you're going to make mistakes, Yeah, but you can fix things. You're going to live in them and think that you built the river the right way and then just decide, you know what? The river doesn't quite go all the places that I need it. Like we even discovered that with our tiny house. We just literally made an amendment to the dehumidifier Hmm. in our tiny house last week, which changed the path of the river. And there was always this one little place that was kind of stale. And it's like 200 square feet, right? Um, It's called the hashtag tiny lab. And it was definitely an experiment, but we discovered that fresh air too, because we would have people in and we had two cats a kid, a baby, a composting toilet, a litter box, two grown Definitely. adults, a man, sneaky, <laughs> and uh, and you couldn't smell any of it. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. You know, we really could probably talk on this topic for an hour. So what we <laughs> should do is make a podcast on this episode. And in fact, we have already done that. Uh, so guys, if you're not familiar with my podcast, we're going to publish this similar time frame. I'll put a link in the description for my podcast. In the meantime, to learn more from these guys, what Corbin and Grace have done, which I think is so awesome, is they're now in season three 
of homediagnosis.tv. You can actually watch it on that website, .tv, homediagnosis.tv. They're educating the public and builders on not just the mechanics and the details like we do in the build show, but the why and why it's important to you. And they've got some really good, very specific advice, kind of like what we got to today uh, about those systems and why you should care about them. And so I'd highly encourage you, go check out their website, go watch their seasons of homediagnosis.tv and think about potentially even embedding some of those on your builder website because we want more and more of the general public to understand why building science and home chemistry and all these topics are important to them so that they'll go to builders like you and I and request a tighter house, a better build house, a house that has uh, more thought and care put into it. Because ultimately, we're never going to build a perfect house, but the better and better we build, the healthier our houses are going to be, the more resilient they're going to be, the more disaster proof they're going to be. And ultimately, we're going to build better houses than we have in the past in America. And I'm really excited about that. And so, guys, I really appreciate all that you've done to educate me and the builder public out there. We and appreciate you being on the show. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Totally. I'm in I'm in uh, a couple of their episodes as well. Episodes. I'm in four episodes. <laughs> guys, thank you for coming on. Go check out homediagnosis.tv. I'll have a link to all that in the description below. Anything y'all want to say before we uh, close it out? I know we did, did kind of the shortened version today. Please keep building good houses. But people need better houses for and their for their families. Also, I would just really encourage everyone that it's not a competition because it's not common knowledge yet. Yeah. So a rising tide builds all lifts all boats, 100%. and we just need to be in this together. Yeah, I totally agree. And I th I think that when I think about the build show audience and the builders and remodelers and architects that watch the show, we're all really like minded in sharing that uh, and encouraging people to go. If you're not going to build with me, build with another like minded builder. Right. Uh, and so that's that's certainly the case out there. And thank you guys for all you've done to help educate. Uh, and so go check out their YouTube channel. I'll have that in the description. You can follow them on Instagram and certainly go over and watch uh, their three three seasons now. Of well, we're behind we're the scenes right, right now. Three. Yeah. If you want to join Patreon.com and really get into the dig on the show, uh, you can do that. And uh, season three will come out sometime the end of next year, beginning of 2023. All right, good deal. On PBS. Season one and two are up right now already on homediagnosis.tv. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on thebuildshow.com.